Welcome, brothers and sisters, to this edition of our ongoing study on Course 109, Kingdom Oriented Church Growth. And today, we are going to dwell on Lesson 9. We've done quite some tour of the New Covenant in the past eight lessons. And now we're going to Lesson 9, which is the Master Plan and Example of Paul, Part 3. Paul was a master builder of the church to whom the Lord gave the blueprint of the church, how it ought to operate, and therefore every minister of the gospel should make out time to study and to understand the Pauline epistles so that what you are building will not end up in smoke on the last day. Because Paul, as a master plan holder, said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 10, to verse 15, that according to the grace given to him, every work will be tested. You see, some people are building with gold, silver, and precious stones. Others are building with wood, hair, and stubble. They may be born again. They may be spirit-filled. But the structure, the pattern, the motive, what they are doing is not by kingdom, church, principle, and precepts. They are using the precepts of religion to grow their churches, to gather crowd, to build better buildings, and to make money. ABC churchianity, attendance, building, and cash. And the Lord says we should take heed how we build. And if we're going to take heed, it is important we understand the revelation committed to the hand of all the apostles. Today we're going to look at maybe 11 of the principles that frame the church. We've seen other principles all this time, but we'll look at perhaps another 11 principles. If there's time, if there's not time, we'll take the much we can, and then the next lesson we continue. This is such an important topic because there's so much rush of church growth seminars, church growth uh, workshops, church growth conferences, and most of the time, when you go there, what they are teaching, what they are presenting to people are nothing more than carnal principles from the fertile imaginations of human beings. So people are talking about what they want, what they prefer, what their ambitions will achieve. Well, ambition is not the same thing as vision. Ambition is from within. Ambition is earthly. Ambition is carnal. Ambition is worldly. But vision is from above. Vision represents what the Lord wants to accomplish through our vessels. Ambition is what I want to do for the Lord. And religion is filled with people who have plans what they do. The human mind is very strong, very fertile. The human mind has designed all the good things in the world, including the communication medium we are using. When you apply it to the things of the gospel, it can seem to be successful, but on the last day, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 14 and 15, 13 to 15 says, they will be passed through the fire to see whether they conform to the kingdom pattern. And that's why the Lord is taking the approach of giving us a, an understanding of what is of kings, what is of the king and what is not of him, what is of his kingdom and what is of the world. And I pray that the Lord is going to bless us in this lesson. And we all need to be us diligently take heed. Nobody has ever arrived. We are on a journey together. You know what? This that the Lord is releasing, I'm determined that everything the Lord has committed to my trust to serve in any leadership function, it's going to be only these principles. And I think that's what the Lord wants us to do as we learn. Let's make up our mind. Religious process, no way. Worldly concepts, no way. Kingdom first. Kingdom only. Stay in the kingdom. And it is safe. Let us pray and then we go into today's lesson. Father in heaven, who is like you? The answer is no one. And as we gather unto you, Father, we ask you that by your spirit you take the things of Yeshua and show us that he may be all in all in our gathering unto you today. Feed us with your word until we want no more. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, the Pauline epistles present some specific 
guide us on how each paradigm of the church impacts things. And in 11 things we want to look at today, if there's time, number one, as a body, the church is effective as a united entity. And so even though the Lord has said awesome things he wants to do with each of us as individuals there, the Lord still, yet the Lord still wants us to have the mindset that we are part of an organic body. And as the body tells us in Ephesians 4, from verse 1, I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you, are, you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. Why? Because it says in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavor. Make an honest effort. Why? Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, father, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and you all. So the Lord is saying, much as he's given these awesome revelations, let's not ever forget the reality that the church, which is his body, which is the bride as we've seen, it is still a collective. In other words, it's not me alone. It's not you alone. It's not her alone. It's not him alone. It is us. The church is we. The church is us. It's not I. It's not me. It's not mine. It's ours. It's we. Brothers and sisters, that's why he says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a man of some is. And these days it's even much easier because it's not only just local congregation as you must go to that church in your neighborhood. No, there are churches across the states, churches you can drive one hour, churches can drive two hours. You know what? And today, churches you can be part of online, gathering of saints, not church as in you know the old denominational model no the lord said we should there's always a people there's always a people you can connect with there's always a stream of grace you can be part of you know so we tell people look it doesn't matter where you are in the world the fellowship that we are we connect with international ministers fellowship the lord said never denominate it that's why it's open and some people think well, we don't know what we are doing because we are not building organizationally. No. You see, the global school of ministry, it serves the body. It doesn't ask you, are you Baptist? It doesn't ask you, are you Pentecostal? Are you charismatic? It serves the body. The master class, the body is served. Nobody goes to bother you about where you are. Hey, everybody just received from the Lord. And so today, there are many ways you can fellowship. Where you feel a sense of love, you feel a sense of acceptance, where you feel a sense of connection, and you say, don't forsake the assembly of yourself. Don't walk alone. Those who walk alone will fall hard. The body is one. One Father, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, keeping us all together. Principle number two, as a body, the church is a living, loving organism with manifestation of spiritual gifts as activated body parts that minister to the Lord and to each other. That is something important the Lord wants us to know, that we are part of the church, and it's not an organization you join. It's not a building you go into on certain holy days. No, that the reality is that the Lord has put something in me, something in you, something in her, something in him, something in us. And those things, we we'll use it to serve him. We we'll use it to also serve one another. That's why spiritual gifts, they say they're given for us to serve the body, to serve with all. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Ephesians 4, 7. Romans chapter 12. The Lord has ordained it to be so. That's why he said in, first, in Ephesians 4, 7, but unto everyone, not some, not a few, unto everyone, born again, unto everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of the Messiah. There's a measure of the gift in you. 
If you don't discover it, you might just be rolling around circles. If you don't discover it, you can burn out trying to exert yourself. The gift is for you to serve. The gift defines your service. It defines your place in the body. If you don't discover your spiritual gifts, you are not doing yourself any good. If you know other things, but you don't know your gift, you are actually deficient in knowledge because the gift it defines who you are. It indicates what the Lord wants to do with you. The Lord is not looking at your external feature. He's not looking at your, your, your money or whatever. What the Lord is looking for is the gift in you. And the Bible says, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. We need to come to a place we don't know people after the flesh, but by the Spirit. What is it that the Lord has given this brother, this sister, that I need? What is it that is given this brother that you need? And that way there's a matrix of love. That's the way the Lord has ordained his body. And that's why he said in Romans chapter 12, he says, verse 3, For though I say through the grace of Elohim that is given to that any, everyone that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as Elohim had dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we be many, are one body in Yeshua, and everyone members of one of another, having them gifts, differing according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy. He said, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teacheth on teaching, he that exhorted on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And he that ruleth with diligence, but he that showeth mercy with, with cheerfulness. So that's what the Lord wants us to know. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it begins to break down the gifts and tells us what they are. And it tells us in verse 7 that the manifestation of the gift, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit without. The gift is given to you for the profit of the body. It's not your own. You are a steward of the grace of, in that gift. And you have to steward it. You have to make sure you use it to serve. You don't go and bury it in the ground. And this is so important. And if you read the whole of First Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about this very, very detailed. Brothers and sisters, read Romans chapter 12, 1 to 8. Read all of First Corinthians 12. Read Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 7 to 10. And then, of course, you can also read what Peter said in First Peter 4, Eight, uh, ten, and eleven, and you get the grief. You get the you get the core of what the Lord wants you to know about spiritual gifts. Number three, as a body, the church is held together by charity or practical love. As a body, each part of the body, just like the human body, you know what affects the eye, affects the finger. What affects the finger affects the eye, the brain. There's a connection. And because there's a connection, what affects one affects all. And the Lord wants us to begin to walk in love for one another in charity. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul, by the Spirit, brought out this charity. He said, listen, he said, even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and there's no charity in the heart, and become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, empty, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have no charity, I am nothing. That's serious. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be born, I have no charity, it profited me nothing. And then he began to tell us what charity is. It's long-suffering. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't vaunt itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave unseemly. It does not seek her own. It's not selfish. It's not self-centered. It's not easily provoked. It doesn't think any evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Then in verse 13, he says, And now abided faith, hope, 
charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. At the end of the day, that's what will take us before the Lord. And so while we're on earth, you say, hey, die to self and just live in love. And Romans 13 verse 8 says, Oh, no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Everything in the law. Just loving is fulfillment of the law. And Ephesians 5, 2 says, And walk in love as Yeshua also loved us, had given himself for us an offering and sacrifice to Elohim for a sweet smelling savour, sacrificial love. The body is sustained by that sacrificial love. Number four, the body and bride should be holy as unto the head and groom. You see, he's the head, we are the body. He's the groom, we are the bride. Even if so, the law of Amos 3, 3, 2 cannot work together. Instead, if they agree, he is holy. He has nothing in him that is sinful. No, no propensity to sin. He is pure within. And that's why we are told in Ephesians 5, Be ye therefore followers of Elohim as their children. And walk in love as Yeshua also loved us. Then he says in verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named. Any, anything that has a tincture of sin in it. He said, let it not be once named among you. But fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming sins. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, no one involved in sin of the flesh, nor unclean person, nor covetous person, who is an idolater, had any inheritance in the kingdom of Elohim and of Yeshua. He said, let no one deceive you. A strong holiness unto the Lord. If we are truly redeemed, there's a change that happens. When we repent and we are converted, there's a change. That change, he says, don't let anything take your eyes off him. Don't let anything, love of the world, whatever creep in and then you begin to have affections for things that are illicit, things that are outside the, the, the principle of the Lord because you are dwelling in him. You abide in him and he in you. And the Holy Spirit is working in us both to will and to do his own good pleasure. There's no room for sin. Somebody cannot go into sin and say kingdom. It's not a sinful kingdom. It's not a kingdom of sin. It's a kingdom of righteousness. It's a kingdom of holiness unto the Lord. He separated us from himself. And he said, hey, you know what? Hold on to him. Don't let an enemy take you out. In Romans 13 verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, say, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. If you love people, you don't want to defile them. Brothers, sisters. Sister doesn't want to defile brothers. Brothers don't want to defile the sisters. So anything that will lead to start defilement, this doesn't even feature in the heart. It doesn't feature in the mind. Because as Paul told Timothy, you look at them as brother and sister. Brothers and sisters don't do defiling things. Men and brethren, the Lord is speaking to us. Then number five, without order, liberty in the body will be disruptive and only defying. So the Lord, as much as he's called us to liberty, he also says that without order and balance, liberty is going to be disruptive and only defying. If you have time, read the whole of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want to give you a little background of 1 Corinthians 14. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talked about spiritual gifts, why you need to know them and walk in them as an instrument of service. Then in chapter 13, he talks about love as the key, the motive, the, the driver for use of the spiritual gifts. Then in chapter 14, it comes to order. Today I was teaching a class somewhere in Africa. They were shocked what they were seeing in, some of them were shocked. You could see that. Some of them were shocked in what they were seeing in 1 Corinthians 14. Things that are there. 
you know, many Pentecostals, because of the way Pentecostals have allowed, allowed disorder to come into their liturgical practices, many times Pentecostals are doing the exact opposite of what is in the world. For instance, the issue of prophecy. I have been there. So I'm not talking about you. I have been there. And what is it? All we are taught, all we knew, is that if somebody is prophesying, somebody is around and wants to prophesy, you hush this one and stop him. Let this person finish when he finishes then this one. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says the opposite. He says, supposing you are speaking, prophets are prophesying, and because you are a prophet, you know when the function of the Holy Spirit comes upon a brother sitting by you, he says, you who are speaking, stop. Let him speak. Why? You already downloaded the mind of the Father in your spirit, man. If you don't stop, that person, by the time you finish, we may lose the message from the Lord. But how many people are following these things? No. The Lord says, by way of order, don't go into the pulpit and take microphone and begin to blast tongues and, tongues and people don't know. And at the end of the day, people don't know whether somebody has come to curse them. And people are just excited. You see, if you, unless you have the gift of interpretation or the Lord has planted somebody with the gift of interpretation there, don't take the microphone, don't stand on the pulpit and speak in tongues as if giving a message to the people. Pray in tongues any way you want. Sing in tongues any way you want. Roll on the floor any way you want. In your personal, build up your spirit in the Holy Spirit. Build up the grace of Elohim in you and communicate to the Father and war spiritually, that's fine. But when it comes to go to the pulpit to talk, by all means, you say, you know what? If the gift of interpretation is in you, go ahead, speak and interpret. Otherwise, if someone is planted there, you speak, that person interprets. Otherwise, how can people know when somebody comes to the place and places a course on them and they say, Amen? And so, brothers and sisters, order and balance are important. Otherwise, the body will be disrupted. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 14, it says, verse 33, For the Elohim is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Verse 40, but let all things be done decently and in order. When we are together, people should not just do whatever they like and, and don't bother. No, you need to be concerned about what you do, what you say, how far it is in conformity with the world. Number six, though all saints have residual authority, all saints have residual authority in the kingdom. Every single saint walks in residual authority from Yeshua. However, the king himself places in the body delegated authorities as well as civic authorities. You see, we're in the world, we're not of the world, so there are people in the, uh, in the civil society that are authorities who they, we should submit to them in love. So if it's in the church, you have a pastor, you have an overseer, don't say, oh, I'm, I, am, I am everything, you know, and then it means that you can live anyhow. No. Though all saints have residual authority, the king places in the body delegated authorities and civic authorities. That's why Romans chapter 13 says in verse 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. For there is no power but of Elohim. The powers that be are ordained of Elohim. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resisted the ordinance of Elohim. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Without that, they be afraid of the power. Do that which is good, that shall have praise of sin. For he is a minister of Elohim to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, thou shalt be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. Any authority truly anointed by the Lord bears a sword of authority. You saw Paul excite sword of authority, saying, Listen, that brother who has committed that grievous incest in the house of Elohim, even that not there, I give charge. Take him out of fellowship. Let him be exposed to Satan. Let him get out of the covering of the church. Let Satan do deal with his physical body so that in his torment and pain he will cry to God and Elohim shall have mercy upon him. That's the sort of authority. Peter exercised sort of authority against that man, Simon in Samaria. 
He said, you shall be blind for a season. You know, our brothers and sisters don't strive against any legitimate authority the Lord has placed in his body. Don't strive against authorities in the, in, the, in the civil society also. Don't do that. Religious people, you know what, they are hypocrites. They are those who will pray. They are those who prayed for Obama every day. Word for Obama. The moment Trump came in, they clamped up. All they did was fight Trump, fight Trump. All they did is speak evil of him. The same way, there are people every day, they pray for Trump. They call for prayer. They sue for him. Since Biden came, they are abusing Biden. That's the religion. Are you seeing them? Great, great religious leaders. Are you seeing them? Great prophets. That's religion. Religion can do that politics, that religious politics. But in the kingdom, we can't afford to do it. If people are in authority, respect the authority. Respect the office. You may not like them. They may be brash. They may be weak or whatever. But it's the office. The office is greater than them. Have you not seen in America since 245 years ago, 45 people have been in office. No, it's not even 45. Is it 45? Maybe 45 people, yes. 45 people in office. Since then, you know what? The throne is still there. The one now will finish. Another one will come. The previous one can even come. Brothers and listen. Respect every office. Don't be part of those that abuse those in authority. Your prime minister, your monarch, don't. Respect them. Pray for them. Love them. Even if, like some of those in your, maybe you are an immigrant, then in your home country, the people are butchers and doing all kinds of evil, that doesn't permit you to just go on WhatsApp and forwarding all kinds of video and you are speaking all kinds of listen. No. If you are going to go to equity at the throne of grace, go with clean hands. Respect authority. No authority put himself there. And in the household of Elohim, he said in the book of Hebrews 13, verse 17, Obey those who have the rule over you and submit yourself because they will give account for you. The pastor you submit to, the apostle you submit to, the leader of the fellowship you are part of is going to give account of you. If the Lord asks about you, let him not do it with grief. Oh, God, deliver me from this sister. This brother is scattering everything we are building. Oh, God, deliver me, Father. No, that's an evil report. And I'm talking about holy people. The unholy ones who go and pray dangerous prayer. Father, stop his business. That thing that is making him proud, break it. That's carnal. The holy ones will never pray against you. But their heart will be bleeding. With the way you're opposing all good things, the way you're scattering the work, their heart will be bleeding. That bleeding of their heart, they didn't even intend to. It's just automatic. It just comes up. That bleeding of the heart is an evil report against you before the throne of grace. Because somebody sent them. And you are resisting the work. Plus, let it be wise. Let it be that when someone reminds bless you, there's joy. Father, thank you for this, your servant. Thank you for the grace. Thank you for how he or she is invested in helping to make this work go forward. That's a good report. A report of joy is profitable for you. Number seven, the kingdom church has a governance pattern which serves as instrument he uses to fulfill his kingdom pattern. There is a governance pattern. For instance, there is the fivefold in Ephesians 4. And he gave some apostles some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, the fivefold. What is their job? For perfecting the saints, for the work of ministry, for the defining of the body. The fivefold is given to perfect the saints. It is given so that the saints who are perfected can go and do the work of ministry. As you discover your gifts and calling and take your place, as they teach you, as they instruct you, as they touch you, and then the body is edified. And that is the fivefold. The Lord planted them for the purpose of empowerment. The royal priesthood can never be manifested unless the fivefold takes place. So if the Lord is not restoring apostles only, then when you have an apostle, you say, Wow, we got, uh, we are restored, we have fivefold. No. 
He's not restoring prophets only. So when you have prophets say, hey, we are, we, we are having fivefold. No. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. And if you're a pastor, never rest on your oars. Never ever stop until the fivefold are functionally operational in the ministry that you are leading. It may take time and it does take time. If you take the ministry of Yeshua, it took time before an evangelist emerged in Philip. It takes time, but keep on with it. Keep on teaching, keep on instructing, keep on challenging, keep on exhorting the people because the fivefold is what will perfect the saints. If there is no fivefold, the saints can never be perfected. There is impartation of grace in each of the folds to produce an outcome in the life of the people. Then there is the bishopric, 1 Timothy 3. He is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Then he gave us the qualifications of the bishops. What, does that, what do they do? Bishops are people, they are ruling elders. Elders in the house, and maybe they are leading three, four, five different ministries. They want to put it together under an administrative system. That's bishop for you. Put it together so that there's order in what they are doing. And so those of you who think that the bishopric is greater than the fivefold, it's just taking the gospel and putting it upside down. Yeshua gives the fivefold. The bishopric is by desire. You desire, you are pastor of these three congregations, you are running these five ministries, you are bishop over them. But the fivefold is called to the body. Even if you may be planted in a local assembly, but you are actually called to the body. The grace in you, anyone can tap from it and be profited. So, we also have deacons in verse 8. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongue, not giving too much wine, not greedy or filthy looker, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. That's First Timothy chapter 3. For if any be blameless, the husband or one wife, Having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Then he went on to talk about that and that. And then he talked about the bishops. He talks about the deacons also. Men and brethren, listen. The Lord wants us to come to the place where we know that these are biblical offices. If the ministry you are doing is growing, for instance, a five-fold ministry. Supposing they, began, they begin to grow, plant churches. Now let's say they are Seven churches planted in, say, uh, a state like, say, Mississippi. You can appoint, the, the fivefold can appoint a bishop over those seven churches for purpose of administrative convenience. And not the other way around. Not the bishop appointing fivefold. No. Yeshua gives the fivefold by himself. The, the bishops are by self desire for order. Then, number eight, the, bish, the, 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 the kingdom has a compensation plan. When we're going to do course 114, we're going to into detail with this. We're going to talk about it in detail. But the kingdom has a compensation plan. Those who serve need to be content. They need to trust the king who sends them that he will pay the bills through whatever way he appoints. It's not the plan of the Lord that somebody who is serving in, 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 the, in the work of the kingdom, you are worried and anxious, where would the bill come from? And then some people go to begin to try to make plans for themselves, schemes for themselves, oh, handkerchief, this white handkerchief is anointed. I slept on it. If you take it and when anything you have, touch it, you know what? You are going to be healed. Come and pay $30 for one. A handkerchief you bought for one dollar. You sell it for $30. What kind of profit is that? Or holy profit. That's profiteering. You don't use the ministry to make money. You don't use the ministry to do anything that makes like you are captured souls and you are trading in souls of people. No, we've got to be careful. The Lord has a compensation plan. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. Worthy of double honor. For the scripture said, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treaded out the corn 
and the laborer is worthy of his reward. It's in Elohim's plan that those who serve him full time, he takes care of them. He has a mechanism for doing that. And if you are anybody, you are an elder in a ministry, don't allow a situation to arise where the pastor, the Lord placed over you, or the overseer, the Lord placed over you, is suffering and you are there. No. Make sure there is a way whereby the ministry gives double honor to those who serve well and the Lord had different ways of serving. And so we need to make sure that we do, we, and there, but the leader must be content. One who can abase and abound. You go to somewhere, they offer you a five star as place you reside for the uh, one week you're going to do that conference. Praise the Lord. You go to another place, they say, hey, we don't have a hotel, we don't have funds for hotel, but we have a brother, we have a couple, we have a family, they have a spare room, which is, you know, self-contained. Praise the Lord. The brother, they have a room, it's not self-contained, the toilet and bathroom, one is shared by all the people in that house. Praise the Lord. Be content in your estate. Don't go and develop covetousness. Otherwise, before you know it, you are doing many kind of stuff to make money, and those things can make you. That's why Paul warned, Philippians 3, 17, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which works so as you have us for an example. For many walk, Paul said, many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Messiah, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory in their shame, who mind earthly things. Many walk, they are covetous. The Bible says covetousness is idolatry. Number nine, no sin should rest on his or her oars. No one ever arrives until you arrive at the pearly gates. There's always room for more. There's always room for more. That's why Paul said in Philippians 3 from verse 7 that what things were gained to me those I counted lost for Yeshua yea doubtless and I count all things for the loss of the excellency of the knowledge of Yeshua my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them be done that I may win the Messiah. Be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is available to him by faith, that I may know him. Look at, after so many years of serving the Lord, Paul was saying that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. So it's important. We press on. There's always something the Lord wants to do with you and me. Something. An area, it could be in the area of meekness, it could be in the area of more, you know, compassion, more graciousness, it could be in any area or the other. If you're a teacher of the word, it could be in the area of mining the deeper depths of the world to get the meat for the body. There's always room for more. Those who are not growing, they start dying. There's room for more. Let's grow in Him. Let's grow in grace. And when we are growing in him and in grace, then we will discover that there is much more ground to possess. There is much more ground. There is always reams of revelation, reams of endurance, reams of grace we have not yet attained to. And that is something the Lord is calling us. Number 10, every saint needs to live in consciousness of the reality that the church can only be glorified when Yeshua returns and, and then we reconnect with him. Consciousness of end of the age as fast approaching becomes a critical hallmark of the kingdom church because that is when we will reign with him as co heirs. Revelation chapter, I mean Romans chapter 13, 11, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is fast spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put ye on the Lord Yeshua. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the laws thereof. You see, every single day we live, the day is approaching. 
And there's a way the Lord wants us to live as a default position. As long as we're alive. The Lord wants every generation of Christians to live as if the Lord is returning in your time. That's the way he planned it. Default position means is the basic operating thing in the mindset that the Lord is coming in our time. If he doesn't come, praise the Lord. And you finish your pilgrimage, die in the Lord, praise the Lord. But everyone who loses sight of that is going to live a careless life. That's why he said, prepare to meet thy God. Prepare to meet him. Prepare. And that's why the Conference of International Ministers Fellowship UK this weekend, prepare to meet thy God. Friday and Saturday. Then three weeks from now, IMF, United States of America, the first weekend of August, prepare to meet thy God. Their own conference is all on Zoom, so you can participate in this and that. And then other national chapters will have their own conference. Prepare to meet thy God. This is what the Lord wants every saint to know. Brothers and sisters, those who complete their pilgrimage before he returns, you know what? They sleep in him. They rest in him. On that day, the sound of the trumpet, the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive shall be changed in a moment of time. What is called a rapture is just describes something. That in a moment of time, somebody is changed and caught up to be with the Lord forever. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 to 58 talks about this. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18 talks about it. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 to 11 talks about that. Hebrews 9, 27. And it's appointed unto men once to die, after that the judgment. So Yeshua was once offered to bear the sins of many, and then to them that look for him shall he appear the second time unto salvation. Brothers and sisters, number 11. All true saints are conscious of the reality that while on earth, the way we serve as co-laborers with Yeshua and as ambassadors of his kingdom will be assessed on the last day. We will account for our gifts, for our callings, for opportunities before us, for money put in our hand, for time put in our hand, for grace put in our hand, for resources put in our hand. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Yeshua that everyone may receive the things done in his body according as what he has done, whether it be good or bad. And that's why Paul the Apostle, because he discharged all the bullets of his life. You know, the man John Wesley, of blessed memory, his dream was to die empty. Everything the Lord gave to him, he threw into the process. By the time he died, all they could find. I don't know whether it was a pound or a shilling or whatever. Everything was invested in the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered. When you discharge your bullets, when the time comes, you don't struggle with debt. You don't. In the case of Paul, he was to be beheaded. He knew it. Because as a Roman citizen, they can't crucify him. But they can behead him. He knew. He said, Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 6. For I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me, but unto all them that love is appearing. Those who are invested in doing the right thing, the right way, and what the Lord has given to you, you do it faithfully. Listen, brothers and sisters, the Lord is not looking for the number of things you did, the quantum of things you did, the size of the building you built. The Lord is looking for your faithfulness. So if what he wanted to do is to pastor a church of 50 people and you are faithful in pastoring them, you, it counts for Elohim more than somebody who has a church of 500 people but is so busy jetting up and down the people that are not pastored. Brothers and sisters, there is a day of reward. If we get it right, this framework 
is to prepare us for the things we're going to study tomorrow in the next lesson, the next two lessons, some practical things we'll study that we need to do. If we do them with the understanding of these 11 principles, we are going to succeed. We are going to engage in kingdom-oriented church growth the right way. We will not miss the track. We're not going to crash out. We're not going to be diverted. And I want to encourage you. Let's take the Lord seriously. Let's take his word seriously. By way of assignment, number one, please summarize briefly 86 of these 11 points we made today. 86 of them, summarize them briefly and put the relevant scripture. Two, what new thing did you learn today? What new thing did you learn? And three, how do you intend to apply this lesson to your work with the Lord and your ministry? Whatever he commits to your hand, whether you're already in ministry or you're going to be in ministry, what do you intend to do with this lesson? I want to say this to your brothers and sisters. Please keep us in prayer concerning the revelations the Lord wants to put forth. This August will be 25 years. He asked me, I resigned from my appointment in a denomination. I was doing well. I was loved there. I had prospects and opportunities. But it started with 24 years. I mean, it started with 24 years ago when the Lord began to stir me up. Show me things. And I struggle with that. I struggle with that till August 1996. Someone called to write to the leaders. We discovered the letter the other day. Beautiful, lordly worded letter. Because the Lord taught me about order in his house. You don't destroy something to build another one. I said, please. I thank the Lord for the opportunity for what I've learned. But the Lord said, he's redeemed me for the purpose of the body. And I need to go to do it. Brothers and sisters, 25 years, if you join us in August to just reflect and thank the Lord, any way these 25 years has touched you, whether teaching or networking or whatever dimension, just to thank the Lord for what he's done and to ask the Lord to keep us, to strengthen us, to ask the Lord to release grace in us for all the days he has appointed for us to fulfill the purpose for which he sent on this assignment. And the grace to get it done and finish it. And you know what? For me, the Lord has laid two projects in my heart. One is in the village that is my roots. The other is in the city of Owari, my Jerusalem, where we started. A school of ministry to take off this year, the 25th year of serving the body. When we left all for his sake. And then to empower those who are being trained right now. A hundred and something people are being trained in skills. You know, skills from how to do solar power and install it for people. How to do landscaping. How to do belt shoes. How to do farming, fish farming. You know, fish farming in the village. And various things. How to do pastries. How to do cake and pastries and all that, 32 different skills, including uh, agriculture-based things, and they have been trained in that since March, every Saturday, apart from two Saturdays because of security situation. You know what? By the grace of the Lord, they'll be finishing, and they need to be empowered individually to start their own little business. And these two things, and equipping the Global School of Ministry of Worry to be able to serve in that Jerusalem church, these are the two things. And so in August, by the grace of the Lord, those who have a feeling that you're connected and you want to support that, you can contact uh, Teacher Stephanie Foster, you know, Teacher Stephanie Foster, and by the grace of the Lord, see how we can support these two projects. We love you dearly, and you know what? Like everything we do, nothing, no pressure, nothing. We're just informing you because that's just what the Lord has laid in heart to do to remember these 25 years and as legacy projects. May the Lord bless you. And Father, we thank you for that which you are doing right now. We thank you for your grace, Lord. Every single one of these days you have appointed us to serve the body. Have your way. Do with us what it pleases you to do. Help us to grow from grace to grace and glory to glory. 
Uphold us with your right hand of righteousness and strengthen us with all might. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Let the things of Yeshua be continually before us. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll continue tomorrow. Favor, thank you so much for being on the camera today. Thank you.